Hello and welcome to Mid American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener in Training, Tanisha Shade Spain. We're looking forward to hearing from you tonight, our wonderful viewers, later in this broadcast. But first, we've got some great show and tells to get to tonight. So let's get started by introducing our wonderful panelists for this evening. So we'll start down here at the end of the table. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, John. Yes, I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener. And some of my likes are hostas, vegetables, trees, shrubs, perennials, anything green. <laughs> All right, next. <laughs> I'm Michael Brunk. I'm the Urbana City Arborist. I'm a certified arborist and licensed landscape architect. And I've been with the City of Urbana for about 33 years. I've worked a little bit in trees, landscapes, and we also manage a landscape recycling center. All right, and last but not least. I'm Phil Dixon. I'm an extension entomologist with the University of Illinois. And being an entomologist, I work on insects, answer insect questions. I call Phil the bug guy. <laughs> All right, we're going to start with you, John. We've got show and tells this evening. Okay. So what have you got for us? Well, I, I brought some hostas today. All right. Um, I brought some big ones. This is Empress Wu. This is the largest of all the leaves uh, of, of, of any species of, of hostas. I brought some others. Uh, here you can see that this one here that's special is that the petiole is red. Here the, is, is from the same plant and this part is called the scape for the flower and that is red. That's nice. And then this is just showing some of the variegations and it, there's 7,400 different varieties of hostas, and that's growing all the time. And anybody that would be interested in hostas, if you would be interested in it, this, this hosta book here, the Hostapedia, answers just about every question that you could ever have. Also brought some of my tiny ones. If you compare my Empress Wu with Mighty Mouse, you can <laughs> see it's Mighty Mouse isn't so mighty. And <laughs> I, I took a sand casting of not this particular leaf, but one of its sisters, and this is made from cement. And it's, it's, it's weighty, but if you want to preserve it and make a butterfly uh, bath for it, uh, th they work really well. Now, how, about, how much does that weigh? Uh, I'd say six, seven pounds. Wow. It's made from cement. And you cement. painted it too. I painted it and then I filled it with or, or covered it with polyurethane so it can stay outside. And looks very, very nice. Very nice. Very yeah. nice. Awesome. Thank you so much. All right, Mike, you brought something to share. Yes, as well. I did. We created a publication a number of years ago and we have the second edition out Exciting. Uh, under the canopy. And what the purpose of this publication is, a number of community arborists got together and professors and universities and extension specialists, and we try to address the majority of questions people ask us. So if you get this publication, you open it up on the first page, we talk about planning, thinking about the, for selecting a tree, uh, seasons and the site to where you're going to put it and the size. Uh, we also, on, on the first uh, page when we open it up, talk about the right tree in the right place uh, we have a bird's eye view that shows some distances that we suggest of trees away from driveways and visibility uh, triangles in your driveway and dr uh, uh, street intersections, things to avoid. Uh, on the next pages we have a, a very nice panel that has a spreadsheet of trees that we'd like to see more of. Uh, we talk about planting a tree on this page and caring for trees. Uh, proper pruning and how to water new trees. And then the exciting thing that we all like the most is we have artist rendered trees on the very back so it makes a really neat poster. So they're color rendered trees of actual trees in the state of Illinois. And it gives people a good idea for uh, what they may look like. So this is a fun publication. Over 100,000 copies have been shared with uh, communities, citizens across the state of Illinois. So How can folks get their hands uh, on Very one? good question. So <laughs> most of the extensions across the state of Illinois have copies of Under the Canopy. Many communities have copies of Under the Canopy. And for example, in our community, we put them out at the city building, at the public works department, and at the uh, community libraries. Uh, so you may call your extension or your community, and if they don't carry it, they certainly can call me, the Urbana City Arborist, Mike Brunk, uh, and I can connect them up with the publications. Great, 
And just in the few weeks that I've been here, I can't tell you how many questions we've had about this tree being too close to my house or this tree is giving off too much shade or what am I doing wrong, so. And I actually brought you a copy. Hey, I won't be one of those people then. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. One of thank the things you. I've seen is people now are, are learning that they're pla they've planted their tree too deep. And right. that's one of the, the biggest killers yeah, of mm -hmm. you're right. trees. You're right. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, thank you. And Phil, you've got something also that you brought. Uh, one thing that you see quite a bit on trees, particularly in shrubs to a lesser extent, are leaf rollers. And these are, these are caterpillars that actually roll the leaf together and then feed on the inside. And here's one that's been, been opened up. And, uh, and you can actually see, well, I can actually see, uh, but uh, there are, what they do is they put uh, strands of silk across. Caterpillars do spin silk, they make cocoons and so on. And so they will, uh, will spin silk across. And then as the silk dries, it's liquid and it comes out of, out of, a, out of, the, uh, uh, out of the jets for the, uh, for, the, for the silk, which is on, on, the, on the mouth parts of the caterpillar. As it dries, it shortens. And so it will bring the leaf together and hides it in there from predators and parasites and so on for the most part. And so uh, the, uh, the resident of this particular one was here earlier today and it was in the bag that I brought, but <laughs> I don't know, I think it liked Tanisha, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but at any rate, it's not, not here anymore, but I did make a photograph of that and, uh, and it's essentially a little green caterpillar that's, uh, that's only up about a half an inch long. And so, uh, and so we, uh, it's, it will live in there. And then in the area, this happens to be on persimmon, but there are leaf rollers that occur on all different kinds of trees and shrubs. Uh, as I was looking around and so on, I found, uh, I found this one here that is, that is kind of whitish. And, uh, and, the, uh, and the white one is, has gotten a fungus disease and uh, that killed a caterpillar, which is typically what happens when a caterpillar gets a fungus disease. And so there's a close up of it now. And, uh, and, the, uh, and this is a very important uh, natural control. And then on another tree, another, another uh, leaf, I found one that was kind of all shriveled up and kind of yellowish at one end and greenish at the other. And that's very commonly the case that uh, caterpillars that have been parasitized by mm. a, what we call a parasitoid, a parasitic wasp or a parasitic fly, mm. that will get in and, uh, and lays its, the larvae get inside the insect or live on the outside, most commonly inside, essentially eat the inside out of a caterpillar mm. working on the least important first and the most important last. Wow. So you keep the meat as fresh as possible. <laughs> uh, keep the caterpillar alive while you're eating it in, to death. And so these are all natural enemies. But in reality, when you're looking at, uh, looking at leaf rollers, there's something that's kind of interesting. They kind of make the tree look a little bit funky, but it's normally not worth trying to control it. If you want to pick off of the leaves and destroy them, that's fine. But generally you're ahead to just let nature do its thing, live and let live, and, uh, and they will uh, not cause any serious harm to your, to your trees. And uh, it's just part of nature out there that's doing its thing. Wow, I think it's so fascinating that we just see caterpillars, but you can see one that is being preyed on by <laughs> something else. I didn't go to school for all of you. There you go. There you go. All right. Let's go to the phones. I think we've got some calls. We've got Donette in Springfield who is having problems with black spots on her hydrangeas. Donette, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi. Go ahead with your question. Um, I have a hydrangea that is not in full sun all the time, but it has black spots all over the plant. And there's some green leaves, but um, I don't know, am I watering it too much or should it be in direct sun or I don't know. Well, guys, what do you think? When are you watering it? Is it, uh, you watering it uh, in the evening or? Yeah. Okay. okay yeah. Well, I would say it's a fungal problem, wouldn't yeah. you guys? Yeah. Sounds like it could be anthracnose, which is associated with moisture and on the leaves particularly. Uh, hydrangeas are very uh, tolerant of a variety of exposures, depending on the, on the variety in, uh, of, of hydrangea you're looking at, can vary some, but many of them will do well in, in shade, partial shade, full sun. I have some in all of those areas in my yard and they all do well. So uh, it's, uh, hydrangeas are very adaptable, able to handle a lot of situations. 
and it may be that uh, it's due to the high humidity and, and the excess rainfall we've had this year. Uh, if it really bothers you, if it looks like it's really building up, there are fungicides that are, that are mainly preventative, unfortunately, for that, mm -hmm. uh, which means you got to know you're going to get it before you get it, which is you kind of have to see into the future. Uh, <laughs> but another way is that you can you can open up the plant, perhaps get a little more airflow mm -hmm. through it, and the air will dry out the leaves quicker and reduce the amount of leaf diseases that you tend to have. Yeah, you want it to go into the evening dry if yeah. you can. So water in the morning and not not the evening, and try to water without getting the foliage wet. Yeah, if it, it, if with it the high it. the high dew points that we've been having, if you water at five o'clock, yeah. it's going to stay wet until the following morning, and that's ideal. The ideal for fungal growth. Okay, all right. We're going to go to five now. Betty in Effingham has a question about gumballs. Betty, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, go ahead. I have a gumball tree, which I love. I love the, the tree, the shape, and the, the distinct leaf. And But I don't like the gumballs. And I uh, have been using them as mulch around hostas because that prevents the slugs from mm -hmm. eating my hostas, but I'm getting older, so I would, and then someone told me that there is an injection that an arborist can inject into the tree to prevent the gumballs, and I wondered if that is so, and and that there was a time frame to do that, so I'm, I'm wanting to know about that before I, you know, go that route. Well, there there's a spray. I'm not... Mm -hmm. Uh, up to date on any injection. There's a spray with a product called Florel. Um, the timing is critical. It needs to be done in the springtime when the, the flowers are emerging or partially emerged. So uh, it's all explained on the product and a good certified arborist should know how to do that. Uh, it's critical that you spray the entire tree. The drawback is, however, it needs to be done every year. So it's not something uh, that can be done once and, and you have no gumballs. Um, it has to be sprayed every year. It can be washed off. Um, so it's a 50-50 shot. So you have to balance the economics behind having somebody do it and dealing with the gumballs. It may be uh, uh, more um, uh, a better deal for you to hire somebody to rake up the gumballs. So, it's a matter of getting quotes from some good certified arborists and comparing that with what the cost would be to hire somebody to, to clean them up when they fall, I think. Okay. All right. Going to Dave in Atwood with a micro clover question. Dave, are you there? Yes. Hi, go uh, ahead. I've been considering uh, adding micro clover to my uh, lawn. Uh, it's 25 year old. I planted it 25 years ago, bluegrass, and I live in the country and I've battled weeds of every fashion ever since. And I'm about ready to throw in the towel and go with the flow. And I've read on about using uh, regular Dutch white clover as well as uh, more recently these micro clovers. Do uh, you know anything about it? I can't say that I do. I, I um, have a situation where I have several kinds of grasses, and I'll let you talk about the micro clover, but yeah. I, I like tall fescue. Mm -hmm. It's very dense, uh, it's aggressive, and my tall fescue areas don't have the weeds in them that the bluegrass areas and do. And it's much more tolerant of our temperatures and droughts and everything like that. Getting back to your, you know, if your bluegrass is very patchy, yeah, you're going to be getting weeds and things like that, but if you overseed it with tall fescue, um, perennial fescue, then then it's it's you, you could solve it that way. Some of the cover crops, the the clovers and that are getting to be popular in lawns, especially as bee hosts, because you are going to have the flowers. And so, um, call the extension office; they have handouts on that. I know uh, Vermilion County and, and Champaign County both have it, and. Uh, They've got lots of good information. There's positives and negatives. Uh, it depends on what you want your lawn to look like because uh, you're going to have that color flower in there. It's just not going to be um, green. It's going, you're going to have those, but those flowers are going to attract lots of, of uh, bees and other, other beneficial insects too. Okay, all right, we're gonna go to six now. Kay Indicator with a question about hostas and we know who's gonna answer that one. Kay, go ahead with your question. Hello. I was wondering, I just saw this huge leaf hosta 
Does it have to be planted in the shade? And I have other hostas that get a lot of sun, and they're just uh, they're just oh going to town, boy. But I didn't know if the big leaf one had to be planted in the shade. I do have pine needles abundant. Didn't know if that might present a problem. Mm -mm. What do you think? No, I, it, it, depending on, on your soil, um, hostas don't like dry to be real dry. Uh, this hosta here, the, the big one, is Empress Wu. And being it's so green, it will take a little bit more sun if it has the proper moisture. That's the key. Uh, if, if you have evening sun, that's harder to keep, keep them hydrated. But uh, hydration is the main thing. Uh, that's why they dry out so so quick. If you were going to plant them under a tree where, yes, they get the evening sun, you know, because there's, there's nothing between the sun and, and your hostas, I would question that because it's very hard for the hosta to fight the tree roots for the, for the moisture. Uh, I, I like to plant the ligularia near my hostas because it's kind of my, my hydrometer, so to speak. And if the, the ligularia is limp, if it's fallen to the ground, I know my hostas need watering and um, the, the ligularia will fade before the hostas do and you just want to watch for sun scorch which is the main thing that you would see with sun, uh, hostas in the sun but that one would do as well as uh, there is one that's called sun power that does good in full sun um, it's a fairly new hosta it's a yellowish hosta it's not quite as big as this one but it they, they are starting to come out with hostas that that do work well uh, in the sun. So again, it's, it's, it's one of those things that, you know, you have to work with. And hot, dry, compacted soils, right here. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get. Concrete. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to Les, who's in Danville, uh, with a question about less care in their garden. Les, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hi, go ahead. I was wondering, um, and I've been told that if I use less care on my garden around, you know, the plants to keep the weeding down, that uh, it will destroy the nitrogen in my soil. Is that correct? <sighs> what they're talking about is if you work it into the soil. Um, it, it, you know, that's, it's not composted. It's, 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 got, it's wood and, and fibers. And if you work it into the soil, it is going to rob some of the nitrogen out of the soil so that the microbes will start to break that, those wood chips and, and fibers down. As far as it really affecting your plants, I re if you just lay it on top or if you lay some newspaper down and then put your less care on top of that, no, it's not going to, to rob your, uh, your garden of, of nitrogen. Uh, actually, after you put it down and a couple of years and those, those those cells start to break down, it's going to start to release nitrogen, and it's going to be the nice slow nitrogen that when you get a rain, it's going to penetrate the soil. And so in the long run, you'll get a lot more nitrogen if, if, as long as you don't work it into the soil. Okay, we have a question specifically for Phil. Uh, Dell in Urbana. Dell, are you there? Yes. You've got a question for Phil. Phil, I've torn out all of uh, the... Uh, landscaping in the front of my house and in pl replaced it largely by use of barrels, uh, synthetic barrels, and <clears throat> you have to drill holes in because they don't do it, so you got to have your drainage. I've done that. This year I've used a variety of annuals, and <clears throat> I know that they will not overwinter, so I plan to take them. I may, I may replace some of them with mums for the fall then i'm going to take them out for the winter they are have a bit of garden soil in the bottom and then they have potting soil on top what do i do with those barrels when i've taken everything out for this season to, how does that soil over winter and is there anything that i can do that will be helpful um it's not really my area of expertise, but I'll give my opinion and then move it on to people no more. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the, uh, uh, the barrels, the soil will do well there. You want to make sure that, uh, uh, particularly if they're straight-sided, they should not have any freezing and rusting of the, of the plastic barrels or whatever it is that you have them made out of. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you want to make sure that that soil is still fertile 
for the next year and me being a, a cheap gardener, uh, I would look and see how well the plants lived, grew in the pre year before. And when they get to where they're not growing like I think they should with everything else being equal, uh, then it's probably time to change the soil. A better way would be a soil test, but I have to pay money for that. So uh, either way will work and then I'll turn it over to people who really know what, I'm ta what they're talking about better. The only, the only concern I would have is when you have barrels or containers and you're watering those containers, you're leaching out all the, the, the minerals and, and changing the pH. Mm -hmm. So pH is, is mm -hmm. probably what I would check utmost in the spring is see where your pH is. If it's, not, if it's gone way acid or way basic, you need to neutralize that. And, but I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't change it until I tested it because guessing is not the way to go because you're going to guess wrong and you're going to make, make it worse than better. So uh, as far as you can get some season long type fertilizers that will last throughout the season and and uh, you know I don't see any problem with container gardening. It's, it's nice in, in that if you want to grow some specialty crops and control the pH, it's much easier to control the pH in a small container than it is throughout the yard. Sure. And there, yeah. and there are testing kits that will help you test the pH relatively uh, inexpensively yeah. and you want to have generally something that's just on the, on the acid side of normal so uh, uh, or, or, or median the median pH would be seven so anywhere from about six five to seven is probably ideal yeah okay we're gonna go to six now Marilyn in Decatur she has a question about a bird feeder Marilyn are you there not a, <coughs> not a bird feeder but a tree oh I'm sorry <laughs> I'm, I'm moving and I'm going to uh, plant a tree outside my window. I don't want a big tree, and I don't care whether it's flowered or otherwise, but one that will hold bird houses because so many trees, the branches are not uh, strong enough until it, it gets pretty old. So I, I would like to know what kind of a tree I should get. Well, if it was me, uh, my first thought, uh, now they've got a little thinner branch structure, but I like the ammo anchor because it's mm -hmm. flowering, it's got a, a nice fall color, and it has a berry that birds are attracted to. So that tree in and of itself will draw birds. So that's a thought, an ammo anchor, it's called a service berry. There's a number of varieties of service berries. Another one I like outside a window would be a Kooza dogwood. Um, it's got a little stouter branch. It has a very interesting bark on it, and it has spring flowers, and it's branched such a way that you could probably put bird feeders and bird houses in, in that tree. Now, I, depending on your birds, you're not going to want to put them too close because they have their own little territory. So bird feeders and houses together probably wouldn't work very well, but those are a couple of suggestions. Okay. We're going to take uh, line five really quickly. Uh, we've got Robert and Arthur with a milkweed problem. Robert, are you there? Yes. Go I ahead. Have an L-shaped uh, garden, and the milkweeds are taking over the whole garden. When can I cut part of not mess up the monarch? Well, the monarchs are, of course, going to be feeding on the leaves, and if you just take out the plant, you're going to take out the monarchs with it. Uh, if you uh, if you want to transfer uh, larvae from one plant to another, if they're fairly large, you can pick them up with your fingers and move them fairly easily. Uh, if they're very small larvae, uh, you can use a paintbrush works well. That's what professional entomologists use to to move uh, to move tiny insects that have just hatched. Uh, the little uh, the little uh, paintbrushes that you'd get in say a child's watercolor set. It's a very small. Uh, paintbrush type thing, and uh, and dipping that in a little bit of water, the the, in, the tiny insect will adhere to that, and you can move it to to another plant. But uh, generally, probably the best way to look at that would be to uh, would be to uh, eliminate those milkweeds that you can't see any larvae on, and and eventually, as ones grow up on the ones that do have larvae, and you can you can get them down to the number of milkweeds you want to have in your garden. All right, we're going to go Diane on four. We've got two minutes left. Uh, Diane, what's your question? I have found several spots in our yard. Um, the best I can research, they look like necrotic ring spots and possibly some brown patch. I'm just wondering if you would recommend that the landowners try to treat this themselves, or is it something we should definitely call a professional to help us out with before it's too late? Got about a minute. 
it depends on what's causing it. Uh, you know, if it's if it's you know we've had a, a really bad year winter. If it's uh, it, it could be grubs, it could be it could be just about anything. So first of all, we need to diagnose. So I would say you probably need to get somebody in there to find out what your problem is, and then you can treat it. Sometimes you can just overseed it and you know work it work the ground up this fall once uh, after labor day then you start reseeding it a little bit and uh, but i would call call somebody in to find out what your problem is and then go from there and there are fungicides that can treat brown patch yeah and the plant clinic will help you identify what you've got always can count on the plant clinic okay podcast promo. Episode 16 is now available uh, for Mid American Gardener. In this episode, Victoria sat down and had a lesson from Jim Appleby on pine wilt disease. So definitely check that out on all places that you can find our podcast. You can leave us a voicemail, you can find us on Facebook, and you can also find us on Instagram. So several ways to reach out and find us. And before we go, we would like to say thank you and goodbye to Nick Olson, one of the crew members here. He's actually, this is his last show this evening and he's leaving for grad school so we want to say thanks so much to him for all of his uh, work on the show and best of luck in the future so guys we had so many phone calls we didn't get to answer any of our email questions but that's a good <laughs> that's thing okay. that's right that's a good thing we had lots of calls so we will see you next week thanks so much for watching good night